Today is this all we're going to talk about today? Shh. And we're live, uh, notwithstanding Kate's efforts to speak during the uh, process of going live. It is Thursday, May seventh, two thousand twenty, five o'clock p.m. The Sun reports that the lockdown in Britain has been extended for three weeks with only minor tweaks to come after Boris Johnson orders maximum caution. It's kind of like the maximum pressure campaign on North Korea, except that it's on the coronavirus and it's maximum caution. In the United States, Michael Flynn is gonna be a free man because the Justice Department under Bill Barr has come in and argued that there was no basis for a predicate for an interview with him. I don't know what that has for the corona, uh, what that has to do with coronavirus lockdown, except that we are not allowed to have fun anymore unless you are Michael Flynn, in which you are suddenly allowed to have fun. But in lieu of fun, we have Margaret Taylor, who is actually one of the most fun people around. And uh, that kind of crept up on me because when I first met Margaret, I didn't actually realize that she was super fun. You look but... like such a fucking drag, Margaret. That's what he's saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why not? I'm an understated kind of fun. Wow, yeah, there, there Ben. Was a, there was a difference between like seeming really nice and uh, smart and interesting, which was what I uh, took from Margaret. And then knowing that she had it in her to write the I'm responsible for vetting the State Department whip guy story. Well, which, can, I, uh, <laughs> can I just say that, so I obviously, you know, Ben, I was on Capitol Hill for five and a half years and I'm not sure people realize this, but on Capitol Hill, humor among the staff and even with the members, like it is, um, it's like gallows humor. Like that is the type of humor that people do up on Capitol Hill. And when I came to Brookings and Law Fair, like I was still doing that humor. And I remember there were a few times where I would say something that up on the hill would have like left people laughing. And I just got like blank stares from people at Brookings. <laughs> and so I actually had to like deliberately adjust, like adjust my sense of humor to kind of suit a new cultural environment. So that might have been it. I was kind of holding back, trying to figure out like, what is it that makes these people laugh? Because it's just very different from Capitol Hill, very different. But your sense of humor, Margaret, is super like, like it has this sort of pretense of being cautious. And it's like this, um, it's, it's often very subtle and it like <laughs> takes me half a second to realize that something was funny. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a very specialized kind of humor. I'm going to take that other as a compliment. Im other important things you need to know about Margaret Taylor. She is a Brookings Fellow. She is uh, the Lawfare uh, Congressional Guru. Uh, all things Congress and Lawfare combined with a cool kind of foreign relations law lilt. She is also the, she's gonna, I'm gonna get this wrong in detail, but right in spirit, the former world record holder for the largest fish caught in the state of Maryland. So I was really hoping you would ask me about that. And just in case you did it, <laughs> tell me ready everything. To point it out, this is my award that I got in 2006 and it's actually it's a little more specific it's that i was um i caught the largest sheep's head fish in maryland in the chesapeake bay that had ever been caught at that time so it's it was 13 pounds which is very large for a bay sheep's head fish the the previous record was like six and a half pounds or so. So I oh, like shattered it. Yeah, shattered it. You um, just like stomped all over it. Exactly. I was so happy. So that was way back in 2006. Um, it I have since been overtaken though by uh, by someone else. But so what is a sheep's head fish like? Does it have horns and <laughs> are there rams and ewes? What 
what makes a fish a sheep's head fish? So if you look at a sheep's head fish, the you, you, you would understand why they call it that because it has this like almost, it's like a face almost like a mammal, you know, like a sheep. It looks like a sheep's face. And you guys, the teeth, it's got teeth in it that are like, like an old man's teeth. Like, what are like old human... man's teeth. I think of old man is not having any teeth. Well, so it's... like, what is? <laughs> so this fish was was so big, uh, because it was old basically, and it has like I, I kid you not, you, we just couldn't believe it because when when we had it, um, oh, you know, interesting. We, we, my my parents, whatever they had it, not taxidermy, but it's a, it's a modern form of that called marine art. But anyway, we got the teeth, the actual teeth, and it looks like human okay. teeth. It's insane. It was insane. I have to show this picture because this is like you really. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Whoa, that is yeah. totally nuts. And so the sheep part, like the eyes are really wide apart. And so if you kind of look at it, it looks like a sheep. So anyway, and that's... so here's here's the key question. Are you a particularly experienced uh, fisherwoman who has, you know, spent your youth uh, yearning to break fishing records? So as as much as I would love to say yes to that question, <laughs> Uh, because I, I grew up on the eastern shore of Maryland, surrounded by water, on boats all the time, you know, sailboats. I'm thinking of you come. like in the library at Columbia Law School thinking it's the weekend is coming up and I can drive out and go <laughs> sheep's head fishing yeah, and something maybe have in. a crack yeah. at that record. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it was a total lark. Um, you know, we were out with this pretty experienced captain. It was, I was with my family and it was, I, we just happened, I happened to catch it. And the, the captain of the ship, of uh, the, the boat, you know, once it, we realized like it was a record, it was like a big thing. You have to take it to like a, a, a certified place to get it weighed so that it's official. You know, it's all very formal. Uh, the, the captain said, you know, I have guys that come out with me. They've come out with me for 25 years, three times a summer. And they, they, never approach anything like this. I don't I know how like, to describe this, but I can't stop looking at Google images of these fish teeth. I know, they're look insane. At, look at it's this insane. one, guys. Look at this one. <laughs> I know. See what I'm talking about? Whoa. What? Old look man's at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's okay. Weird. Sorry. Sorry. I'll stop now. But that like, whoa, that's <laughs> crazy. I'm so, so into this it. All, this all brings us to Michael Flynn. <laughs> Um, I'm he, not has sure teeth. Why, but he has teeth. Yeah, he, who also <laughs> has teeth. Um, uh, and is also slimy and kind of looks like something that may have been pulled out of the bay recently. Um, all right. How far are you willing to go on this, Margaret? What do you mean? Like, I mean, like. About the dismissal? How, how ugly or whatever, do you think it emotions? was? Um, yeah, the Justice Department comes into court today, asks for a dismissal of a case yeah. in which uh, there is a negotiated agreement. They come in with a particularly tendentious historical account of what happened. And as I read the standard, their contention is that if a senior government official with a TSSCI clearance who has been subject to a counterintelligence investigation has a contact with a senior foreign government official and then lies about it to the vice president of the United States, that that is not a predicate for an interview with him. Have you like have you read the brief and do you think that's a like is do you think that's not what they're saying? No, I I think it is. I mean I I, I mean I I'm shocked by it. How's that? I'm shocked by it. I I mean I don't work necessarily in this area, so in some ways like probably someone else should have been on an, in lieu of fun this evening, but no, I was shocked by it. Um I mean I've just I'm sure it's happened before, but I've just never heard of uh, a, a, a case where 
um, the Department of Justice would would make a motion to withdraw after the person has pled guilty. I, I know it has happened before. I just it's so it's got to be rare. Uh, and the particularly idea in the absence of stating that there was a constitutional violation right. or stating that there was uh, illegal conduct. Right. It was like it was like government. upon upon further review of additional facts or something like that, which is and like they didn't I don't say there was Brady material withheld. They didn't say, you know, there was uh, uh, they did not state that there was a constitutional deprivation of any sort. Yeah, and it I, was a plea. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's it's really shocking, and um, you know, I, again, I'm not as familiar as very experienced litigators would be, but it's 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 news to me that like in order for you in order to prosecute lying to the FBI, you know, you have to have um, there, you know, they have to have brought a, an investigation like that's how I read it. They had to have brought an investigation and only in that context is lying to the FBI like a problem, which doesn't like intuitively just doesn't seem like the way the world works, <laughs> because if if people are out and you're being interviewed by an FBI agent like you know, you just don't lie to them. And if you lie to them, you're going to get prosecuted. Like, that's how I think of that problem. Again, if you lie about what your favorite color is, that that's one thing. But if you lie about a set of facts that seem very, to me, to be like very material to this question of, you know, was Flynn uh, sort of working with the Russians or in league with the Russians? That's, that that was like the, the question that they were sort of looking at. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm shocked by it. I'm in saddened, uh, saddened by, by what it's, uh, what it says about where, um, sort of the politicization of the Department of Justice. So I have a crim pro question for you both and for anybody else in the audience who may know the answer. Um, so imagine that Judge Emmett Sullivan grants this motion and dismisses this case with prejudice, which is to say the 1001 case to which Michael Flynn pled guilty. Is the Justice Department still bound, say, when Sally Yates, who will not feel represented by this brief in, her, of, in its account of her concerns, when she's attorney general in nine months, if she is, um, is she still bound by the plea agreement? The plea agreement, which of course Flynn has asked the judge to uh, abrogate, to withdraw his plea. Um, and therefore, could the Justice Department turn around and prosecute Flynn for everything they declined as part of this plea agreement, all the Farah stuff, the kidnapping plot with the Turkish cleric, I mean, all the stuff, his son, right? Um, or does the dismissal of this case in the absence of a separate, of granting the separate motion to get rid of the plea agreement, um, leave the plea agreement in place. The Justice Department is not only barred from refiling this case, but is barred from refiling anything that the plea agreement covers. Okay. I mean, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Are you asking like whether or not like Yates, like in nine months can go back on the plea agreement with? Yeah, because the plea agreement but the plea uh, agreement mean, isn't, between, the isn't like personal. It's the, the plea agreement is an agreement that's honored by the office of the attorney general. Right, it but, it, but, it, but, but the point is that Flynn has moved to abandon the plea agreement. And so my question is, Judge Sullivan has now on his desk um, a motion from Flynn to withdraw from the plea agreement and a motion from the Justice Department to dismiss this case. Let's say he grants both. Flynn withdraws from the plea agreement and the Justice Department gets its motion to drop this case. It can't fi refile this case because this case is, um, is uh, um, uh, been dismissed with prejudice. Right. But can it refile 
or file for the first time all the stuff that he was given immunity to in the original plea agreement. So the question is, what what is the scope of that with prejudice, right? Yeah, I think that that I would. And so. So I'm I'm still like trying to quite. Would it also would it also matter what like which was filed first in some capacity, like which the like which the judge granted first, or if it you know. I don't get what I'm I, saying. Yeah, maybe not. I mean, I think uh, someone think said we need of- pre. I think that, that <laughs> I was like, yeah. Well, we, need some, we, we need somebody who's done, who's done what Ken White would do actually. Um, I could text him. Yeah, let's text him. Tell him we have a serious crim pro question yeah. for him uh, uh, on the Flynn matter. Um, all right, Margaret, let's talk Congress. Well, actually, before we move on, can I just tell you, I actually did work in criminal law a long time ago. I worked up in SDNY in the securities fraud unit. Yeah, I was, this was 1998. Wow. Uh, And I was, I was a paralegal. And I I used to put together like giant spreadsheets of um, like these guys who would put up like a chop shop uh, and, you know, call grandmothers uh, out in Iowa and get them to fraudulently hand over their retirements in exchange for, you know, fraudulent sort of stock certificates and stuff. So that, that was 1998 awesome. was, yeah. It, and it was- Did you it was chant actually, lock them up? Lock them <laughs> up. <laughs> so the great thing about working there and working on securities fraud matters is that there's no, there's no like moral uh, there's no moral issues with it, right? Like I, w- I would have felt worse about working on prosecutions of like, you know, that 19 year old kid in the Bronx who like is selling weed on the corner or something. Like I would have had more sort of moral uh, questions, right, but secu- questions about security that. Security is fraud people. Oh man, like, it was so satisfying. Was like so the worst. It's just so satisfying to just help the very competent prosecutors under- put those guys behind jail. Enjoy. Right, and they're they're not going to be like over sentenced. Um, oh yeah, and, no. and so like under, you know, under the, the eighteen months that they get, of which they serve sixteen, yeah, is yeah. like like you're never worried that you're going to do injustice, right? And the, um, these these guys that they went after, and they were all guys, so I'm not being like literally all of them that that we prosecuted were men. Um, Why don't women engage in securities fraud? And is that a feminist <laughs> problem for you, Margaret? I don't know. I mean, it is the kind of thing you can work from home. <laughs> you, know, yeah, yeah. you don't have to like go to a bank with a gun, which is like kind of a hassle. You know, it is it is a work from home kind of a, of a fraud thing. I don't know. Um, but yeah, like I remember this, this one case, the, the whole Michael Flynn and FBI got me thinking about it. There was this one case where all of the, I swear all the defendants in this this one case, and there were probably like five or six defendants, they all weighed like at least 300 pounds, each of them. And I remember the FBI agent who worked on the case just coming in one day and being like, you guys, pound for pound, this is the biggest securities fraud case <laughs> that the SDNY has ever prosecuted. <laughs> it's pretty Excellent. good. <laughs> those, those say, the FBI agents were hilarious up there. Um, Sadly, um, uh, Pope Hat cannot come on the show, but alas, um, um, alas, in the future. Uh, um, well, let me think about that. We gotta. Can gotta... I ask a question? Because, like, I ha- it's been a while since I've steeped myself in, like, honestly, I don't know that much about everything that's happening today or the background to it or anything. But I think you, I think you know that when I was a TPM, I covered. Um, in 2007 to 2008, the the end of the attorney general firing scandal and Alberto Gonzalez and some of the stuff that was happening there. And I just remember, and I'm not always to be the person who like kind of draws our minds back to like the George W. Bush era, but like, you know, you said before, like this massive politicization of like with Flynn and stuff, like, is it like that? Like, how many times have we said that? Like, I feel like there have been great, like great, like this has been happening pretty consistently across administrations at various so, points. So am I, all, am I just being, 
naive or? I think you're being a little naive. So number one, the US attorney firing scandal was bad. And it was bad. It was something that had not happened in the uh, first term of the Bush administration. It not have, had not happened in the Clinton administration. It had not happened in the Bush administration. It had not happened in the Reagan administration. And so we had we had a uh, a pretty seriously understood set of practices that the second term Bush administration uh, violated, and they violated it. Uh, I don't. By the way. I don't think the president had anything to do with it or knew about it, or um, I think it was, you know, something that went on at the Gonzalez level and below. And, um, you know, I don't, it's actually a, among George W. Bush's uh, faults. I actually don't think he's, except in a sort of command responsibility sense, but look, um, that was a bad episode, and it was one that the administration sort of ultimately acknowledged it had aired in, um, and that the uh, Obama administration did not repeat. And so I think, like, you can say that that was, like, a bad episode, and it is on a different order of magnitude from what we're talking about in these episodes. So that was... Uh, let's get rid of the U.S. attorneys who, in general, aren't being aggressive enough about the death penalty, right? Or who aren't, like, loyal enough. This is, let's throw a case, right? Let's protect the, U, the U.S. government's equities in the Roger Stone matter, in the Michael Flynn matter. Let's... Um, you know, mischaracterize the state of evidence in a variety of, of matters. Uh, let's uh, launch investigations that don't have merit. Uh, that's a very different level of politicization than let's make sure we have our people, good Democrats, good Republicans in the positions in the first place. And I do think that's, I do think it's qualitatively different and I do think the things that Barr is doing right now would have been unheard of in prior administrations. And that's not to say there aren't isolated cases in every administration that people scratch their heads and say, hey, I wonder what the role of politics may have been in this. Often they're in the cases that don't get prosecuted. But I am unaware of a case uh, uh, at least a high profile case where the government, but until today, where the government walked into court in the face of a negotiated plea with somebody who had not merely competent counsel, he had Covington and Burling, right? Negotiated an exceedingly generous plea deal to him that left a lot of stuff unprosecuted. And they said, um, in the absence of the ability to say that it had been constitutionally defective or that the government had engaged in misconduct, they have not said that, that they said, yeah, we don't think the statements, if he lied, were material. And therefore, we are moving to dismiss this case. I, I don't know of a single case like that in the, in the, at least the modern history of the Justice Department. And I do think if you're thinking about politicization, that's a qualitatively different level from the removal of U.S. attorneys who may, you know, who do, after all, serve at the pleasure of the president. And uh, you know, we passed that bar a long time ago. I think I, think I just wanted, I, I have not followed this as closely as you. I haven't followed it really much at all, frankly. I think there was like, when all of this started rolling out, there was like, I think I was finishing my dissertation or something was happening that I was paying no attention to like the news at the time and kind of got behind on it and then stayed behind. And so in piecing it together, it's been hard to get context. And so that's actually super helpful. And I think that you're, I think that I can, I understand that. Yeah, that's completely right. Well, I think, I think it also, I mean, it begs a question that, that it's a little behavioral talking about Twitter. And then I wanted to actually ask you all, which is, um, I mean, to me, this feels like the single the, the one single day where lawyers 
are sort of like the most disheartened and offended and like just it's kind of horrified um, by what has happened here. And so the question is, what do you guys think? Do you, do you think that the you know, career attorneys at Justice who are appalled by this should like, should they be, is this the moment? You know, is this when you quit en masse um, or not? You know, the other option is uh, the, the Justice Department needs its committed, dedicated career professional. So I, I think I fall more on the on the side of um, having not having people quit and having them stay, um, and you know be at the table on the inside. But I just wanted to ask you guys, you know, what you think? Is this that well, moment? I don't. I don't believe that moment. Well, I wouldn't say it doesn't exist because there's obviously some moral point where it exists. Uh, um. I do think it was very important for no uh, career Justice Department lawyer to put their names on this brief. This brief was not an ethical document to file. And the fact that Brandon Van Grack wouldn't put his name on it strikes me as an important statement. The fact that Brandon Van Grack filed a separate motion to withdraw from the case is an important thing. And I do think saying, I will not put my hands on this is a is a important statement um and look this document is filed by um by the acting u.s attorney and no one else that means he literally couldn't get a career justice department lawyer to represent the united states on this that should tell you something now there are a lot of murderers and drug kingpins and sextortionists and you know, all kinds of other people who uh, need to be prosecuted. And I don't want the entire U.S. Attorney's Office um, to, be pro to be resigning in mass. There's actually good public safety reasons why we need good AUSAs doing the good AUSA thing. And I think we do all do have to compartmentalize in our own minds like what are the part what are the parts of the trump administration that are you know the parts that are just the government being the government right what are the functions and what are the functions that are corrupt and bad and need to be repudiated and i think the way the career levels of the justice department have handled this is elegant frankly you know no one will put their hands on this and this is owned by O'Shea, the U.S. attorney, the acting U.S. attorney, by Jensen, the U.S. attorney in Missouri, who did this so-called review, and by Bill Barr, and by no one else. And I think that's the, actually the right way to handle it. And to every uh, AUSA, and by the way, I think mostly the U. you know, the career folks have done a pretty good job at, at least on the line prosecutorial level, you know, when the Andy McCabe prosecution came up, uh, the, you know, mysteriously, uh, a bunch of AUSAs went into private practice. They didn't resign in protest. They just found that working at private law firms suddenly looked attractive and everybody knew what it meant. Um, and the key ones didn't sign the key documents and I removed themselves from the case. And I think that's probably the, like, there's enough that's still the U S government about the U S government that I think if you're an AUSA working on, you know, prosecuting a really bad guy, you should work on that case. Like it doesn't like. The fact that Donald Trump is president and Bill Barr is AG doesn't mean that the guy you're prosecuting is innocent. I don't know, that's the way I see it. And I still would advise somebody, you know, who has the opportunity to go in and serve under the right circumstances to do it. And I periodically get asked that question and periodically give that same advice. And, you know, I, so I, I don't want to see a mass walkout. I do want to see people not corrupt themselves. And I do think there are individuals, including career officials, 
who have corrupted themselves. And, um, and, you know, I think the process, if we ever come out of this, of deciding who the, that category includes is going to be very ugly and very painful and difficult for the Justice Department. And it's something, by the way, that the Biden folks need to be thinking about as they think about a transition. It's different from other agencies. It's different from DOD. It's different because DOD just doesn't have a Bill Barr, right? And it doesn't have a Jeff Sessions and a Rod Rosenstein. There's this continuous pressure that the president has put on the Justice Department that is different from other agencies. And you know how people have interacted with those agencies with, with that pressure is, a, is gonna be a very painful set of questions for the department when, when the reckoning happens, if it ever does. But Margaret, we're here to talk about Congress. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say one thing about the plea agreement, which is that I did a little bit of research because I was remembering this from Crimpro, um, which was that I think that like, I think that the courts are generally split over whether or not they inter it's like, it's, but generally it's considered a contract, like outside of the, in, like between the prosecutor and the defendant and that they, the judge interprets and can decide which elements of the contract to enforce under ultimately has that kind of has that power similarly though i doesn't seem like if it's withdrawn that they have like just like a contract you can't kind of order specific performance of a contract because it would kind of go against basic notions of liberty and force people to perform on certain types of things i don't and i don't know if i'm completely wrong with that but that would like kind of follow for me i don't know if that makes sense to anyone but yeah, I don't know. You're saying you're saying like the judge isn't gonna force like there's no way to force justice right. to prosecute. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That's my, I look, was just looking. I, mean, I, I was just like dotting my. I was just kind of going back through. It's just not my area at all. So I just kind of was like curious to find the answer. I look. I haven't looked at the case law on this, but I uh, I suppose Judge Sullivan could say, "Dude, you entered a plea. You've provided no basis to withdraw it." Uh, I'm proceeding to sentencing. The sentencing is fully briefed. I'm proceeding to sentencing. I've never heard of a judge doing that in a context in which the government wants to dismiss the case. Uh, I suppose the reason to, he might, like he might, he's very angry and he's uh, furious at Flynn's lawyers and he'll be furious at the government for this. Uh, the question to me is whether you know, maybe you do that and you force the DC circuit to reverse you, but most judges don't like go out of their way to be reversed. He's and one of my favorite, I've, I've liked, I, he's come out, he's had a number of high profile cases. I mean, he's been around for forever, but like, he's a great judge. Um, this is kind of, I can imagine him being pissed. Oh, he will be pissed. I mean, he's been pissed for the last two years about this. Yes. And he, he did in December issue a a 90 page opinion blasting nearly every one of the arguments that Flynn was making that the government has now adopted. And that opinion is thoughtful and careful. And um, I would be a little bit careful if I were the government about filing a brief uh, articulating this history in light of that, but that's just me. All right, Kevin R., you have a question, and then we're going to turn to uh, important congressional questions. Um, sure. Um, so I've got the question I had in the Q&A, but I also wanted to just back up what Ben was saying on the, you know, the, the civil servants there. I, I personally have a letter of resignation already in my desk drawer and I need to make a new copy for home because I'm not near my desk anymore for as soon as if anything comes down to me that has a political aspect. Uh, it's, you know, I'm handing it to my manager. And so Can I think- Can I that ask what, what, what department you work in? IRS. And, you know, there are thing, hints that I'm seeing in other parts of the country that there may be things going on but 
nothing that has come to me, nothing, nothing that I've been mm -hmm. close enough to feel that I need to hand that letter over, but it's ready because yeah, I've, you know, I've dealt with enough high profile things that it could happen, but, yep. um, and so I suspect that's probably true in other investigative agencies as well. So like DOJ. I think a lot of people, you know, yep. Are in a very sim feel very similarly. It's not something you hear all the time, and yeah. you have a lot of people who are in the other agencies that are a little bit more in the crosshairs. I mean, it's interesting. IRS was in the crosshairs in the Obama administration, although uh, you know, in in this in this weird other way, right? Which is that people yeah. be because people believed it had been corrupted, it was subject to very political investigation. But, you know, like when you have a, an agency that is uh, a little bit more in the crosshairs, I, I think there are people who are sitting around like asking the question Margaret was asking, like, is today the day? Um, and, you know, I think people err on the side of caution, not because they're craven and not because they're, uh, but because they're actually doing good work, right? And like you believe in the cases that you're working on and Bill Barr is not preventing you from doing the important bank robbery cases that you're working. So today's not the day, even though yeah. it's appalling, right? You know, when, when I was at the State Department, I was a lawyer at the State Department for 10 years and just to like sort of stock advice that kind of circulated around the office on that question was, you know, have, have, have your resignation letter ready and uh, keep it somewhere and think about beforehand the types of things that you will resign over. Like think about it specifically, uh, write it down. And so it was more sort of like know for yourself what your own moral line was. And then, you know, that then you'll know, right? You don't have to wonder from day to day if bad things are happening what you're going to do. It's like, if those things happen that you're like, you know what, this was one of those things I said I would resign over. And so this is the day. So it's more like a personal decision as opposed to like communicating a, a moral inflection point for the country or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So the question I had in Q&A was back to one of the questions that Ben opened the conversation with, which is, you know, in a future Justice Department where they're looking at this Flynn situation and saying, well, we can't prosecute him for the things that we withdrew from. What else can we look at him or people, people around him for? And the question I had was, can, can DOJ use things that are in that plea agreement? Or was, you know, under Barr's interpretation, the plea agreement tainted so that anything that's derived from it is also going yeah. to be tainted. So this is uh, the question or closely related to the question that I was, um, uh, I, that I was playing with earlier. And here's what I think the answer is, but I want to caveat this with like, that I really don't know. And that, you know, somebody who, who has done a lot of a lot of criminal procedure in a way that I have not uh, would have a better answer to this. So take this with a big grain of salt. I believe the answer will be something like this. Number one, the dismissal that the government has asked covers only this 1001 case. Number two, whether the government continues to be ban but like bound by the plea agreement is actually governed by a different question, which is whether, whether Judge Sullivan grants Flynn's motion to withdraw his plea. If he doesn't grant that, then I think the government remains bound by the plea agreement and can't prosecute for any of the stuff that is uh, covered in the immunity section of the plea agreement, the non pros section of the plea agreement. But if Sullivan does grant that motion to withdraw from the, the guilty plea, then that plea agreement is dead. And then Flynn 
and actually Flynn's son, who is in a weird, ambiguous way covered by the plea agreement, is actually vulnerable to a much more serious set of charges. And honestly, I'm not sure, just as I'm not sure why the Justice Department under a future Biden administration, the statutes of limitations will have run if Biden doesn't win. So this is only an issue if Biden defeats Trump. But uh, just as I'm not sure why they, a future Justice Department might not revisit Bill Barr's views of the obstruction questions uh, in, the, in volume two of the Mueller report, I am also not sure why they would consider themselves barred, uh, bound by a plea agreement that Flynn had vacated, uh, Flynn had abrogated in withdrawing the plea and the Justice Department himself had done itself had done violence to the department's own equities, and so I I think that's the answer, but I'm really not sure. Margaret and Kate, do you have thoughts on this? No, that seems. I, I think that like I mean that seems reasonable to me. I just, yeah. I mean, actually, I'm gonna read a question that someone texted me. Um, that okay. Um, but I thought was actually kind of interesting. And if Kevin R wants to come back and weigh in on this from an IRS perspective, that would also be interesting. Um, but the uh, the person muse kind of muses that um, maybe what will really happen in the end is that only the truly honorable people will remain in civil service. And I kind of wonder like what people think of that, if that's hopelessly idealistic or optimistic, or if like that, those are the people who are going to end up waiting out the storm or the ones who are like just the true, true dyed in the wool believers um, that, that stick around and keep working um, in civil service. What do you think, Margaret? I don't know. I think people, um, you know, make the decision to stay in a job for all sorts of different reasons. Um, you know, some people may be just like a couple of years away from retirement and, you know, their pension, others. <clears throat> I mean, you look around in this job market, like it's not exactly, you know, a, a favorable employment situation. So. So I don't know, um, you know, not everyone can quit on principle. Um, people have families to feed and everything. So I think that's a little too much of a purist kind of a way to see it because there's just all sorts of reasons that people stay or go. My, uh, Margaret and my colleague uh, and past uh, a fun guest, Quinta Jurassic likes to quote Machiavelli's uh, uh, line that the prince the, the effective print has of the city more than he loves his soul. Can you and say I that one more time? A, you kind of flipped out there. Sorry, that the prince has to love his city more than he loves his soul. Mm. Um, and I think there's a, I, I think about that line often in the current climate, um, which again brings me to Congress, people with no souls. Um, <laughs> um, Margaret, why can't Congress get this remote thing done? Well, I mean, we have a lieu of fun every day. It's remote. It's public. <laughs> Congress does a lot of business in public. It's remote. Yeah. Why can't we post on a lieu of fun? Have convenient, like, why is it a tough issue? remote voting, you get like, you know, Representative Taylor, uh, yay or nay, yay. Like, why is this hard? You know, I, I have spent some time thinking about this and I think where I'm landing is like, there's a lot of older people in Congress who are very uncomfortable with departing from tradition because they don't know what that, what that holds and it makes them nervous. Um, and they're not familiar with how to use the technology. And so what about dying? It makes them uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm what saying, about what? I, I, dying. I am uncomfortable with dying. <laughs> and I'm not as old as most of them. Are you, do you want to die remotely, Ben? Is that what you're proposing? No, I want to not die. 
They're going to do all of this on the Congress floor and you're going to sign, you'd be like, here, ready to die. <laughs> no, I, that's the point. I don't want to be there to say like, yes, Senator Burr, please breathe on me to let like the, all the virus that's been collecting in your coronavirus beard can be sprayed out at me. I don't want to do that. And I would think that all these elderly people who are high risk, all the factors that you're like uh, describing, they all have like Ruth Bader Ginsburg can learn a conference call, how to use a conference call. It's not that hard. And so why are these people being so difficult about it? And why is yeah, it breaking I... down by party? Why is it that old Democrats are okay <laughs> with remote stuff? But like Kevin McCarthy is like, no, this is unconstitutional. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure. It's it's a little bit more mixed. It looked for a while like it was breaking on um, party lines. But I have to say, like Rob Portman in the Senate, who's a Republican from Ohio, he has he he did an op-ed. He did a whole like roundtable that was virtual to show it could be done to get like the members of his subcommittee comfortable with it. He's been kind of out there on this on a bipartisan way. So there are some people out there, at least with respect to hearings, where there could be some consensus. For whatever reason, though, on the voting piece, it's like people just don't. McConnell's not open to it. Um, Pelosi, I think, is open to it, but uncomfortable with it. Um, and I just, you know, I do think there is an opportunity, for example, in the House for, you know, House Republicans to be like, oh, well, um, you know, House Democrats should just stop being wimpy and come back and do their jobs. And that's like a pretty good, hard hitting political message for them, particularly when the outside politics on the question is this sort of, um, you know, uh, it seems like there's a, a certain percentage of the population who's like, you know, advocating to reopen. And so that that message is like, well, if those people can all, uh, you know, essential workers can go, Congress is essential, we can show up to work. It shows like some solidarity with the people who want to like, you know, physically show up to work, have a reopening, get things back to normal. Um, so it definitely hews in that vein politically. Um, but I do, I do think McCarthy seems a little bit open to a few things, maybe, but it's hard to know if it will actually materialize into anything. So there's it's like, a little bit of politics, a little bit of tradition, a little bit of sort of like, you know, can't we just kind of muddle through, which is like the thing that Congress does, right? <laughs> like, let's just muddle through this thing. <laughs> yeah, but I like, let me argue the other side of this for a moment, partly to be contrary and partly because I actually believe it from the bottom of my heart. Um, like, this is a fucking no brainer. Like, you know, like um, you and I wrote this piece right at the beginning of the COVID crisis, which is why is Nancy Pelosi still giving tours of the Capitol, right? <laughs> that, was is, Louis, that was Louis is, Gomer, but yeah, Louis Gomer Nancy Pelosi didn't giving tours. Down, yeah. Nancy Pelosi was still allowing the Capitol to be open, still yeah. allowing the, you know, um, and there does seem to be a quality of it that is, um, you know, their vision of leadership is a vision of um, let's like the leadership is is the macho vision of of modeling lack of fear rather than the uh, vision of leadership that is modeling the behavior that will actually save lives. Yeah, no, and, I, yeah, I agree. I. I Congress is like the easiest institution in the world to do remotely. Well, there plus, is literally nothing that it does that can't be done remotely. It's true. And, you know, I just did a piece of Scott Anderson where we, where we point out like the executive branch is doing a lot of remote stuff. There's a lot of people who are working remotely. The, the Article Three branch of government, you know, the Supreme Court is doing telephonic arguments. Courts are adjusting. And they're old too. <laughs> yeah. So I, so I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I do think like when we were writing that piece, which feels like eons ago, Nancy Pelosi did say something along the lines of like, no, we can't leave because 
we're the captains of the ship. We we have to be the last ones to leave or, or something like that. And so it was this sort of, um, you know, this is the way we model leadership. Um, I do I do think that Nancy Pelosi has been persuaded a bit by her members who are very nervous um, about it and they don't want to be disease vectors. So I think she has moved a little bit, a fair amount actually. Um, but but I don't know. I don't know how it ends. I, I think that House Republicans and people like Mitch McConnell are just hoping to kind of like muddle through, get to a sort of open place. I mean, we we watched the various hearings, including the John Ratcliffe nomination hearing, and you know they kind of moved in and heats, um, thirty minute you know groups of, of senators who had thirty minute block, and then they would all leave, and then another group of senators would come in. So I think it was. Terrible. It would have been much better on Zoom, by the way. I guess so. I don't know. I guess we'll never know. Um, it was no, because yeah, like on Zoom, Carmelo. on Zoom, you and I can have this conversation, and then Kate can interrupt, like she's going to do right now, <laughs> and we can go, and Kate will interrupt whenever interrupt. she wants. <laughs> there we go. Right, like just like that, <laughs> and. You know, the yeah, problem is you can't interrupt if you're Kamala Harris and you're not in the room. There's um, just like a very, not to make everything always about online speech, but the fact that this is like, this is like basically you are taking, like Ben, even when we have a group of like six or seven people on Zoom, it is completely unadministrable I think, or like we did it yesterday, like when we had all of our guests who could all speak the same thing. They're all friends and know each other and can pick up on each other's signals and like are happy or like know who's going to have something to say about one thing and who's going but, to- But they're all texting each other in the background. Yeah, we're all like, but like <laughs> that's actually like the texting, like there's all of this stuff that like I was thinking about today about the like the affordances, how of like, as we've transitioned to this 95% platform economy of like speech, like this is how we talk now, this way, um, what's lost and kind of what's gained. And like, uh, I think that one of the interesting things is that like, you know, it's really nice to be able to see your face. It's actually really good, but there's still so many, like Ben, you've glitched out like three times today for some reason, you normally don't. But that's actually not a technical problem. I've been glitching. You're glitching. <laughs> yeah. Can we get, can we get the sun on his you? face? I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, but I think that there's kind of like, you never, oh my God, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can't like, I just kind of think that there's something, I kind of get the Congress thing. There is something about being in Congress. That said, I am such a, a legal realist slash skeptic of like Congress. And every time that I've testified in Congress or at the DOJ or wherever, I just feel like it is such a giant, like, I don't know. Um, Cluster? No, that would be like, an, like I think I was gonna say like, like just like fake, fake puppet show, like kangaroo court. Like, oh, yeah. Although I had a totally real moment once. <laughs> Some testifying. people have had nice experiences testifying. No, it wasn't a nice experience, but it was real. <laughs> Louis Gomer asked me once in a congressional hearing, what would happen if Barack Obama decided to conduct a domestic drone strike against a target because he had become inconvenient after leading Muslim prayers at the White House? <laughs> and until you have been asked that in a live congressional hearing, <laughs> I think there's like, you know, you haven't fully been alive. Yeah. It was one of those great moments where I thought, okay, now I can die because I've been asked um, by Louis Gomer. This what did question. you say? What was your answer? Uh, I said that. Uh, Thank no you for curing me of my fear of dying. No, no, I think that, um, <laughs> that there's no question that this would be unlawful and that a president wouldn't, uh, you know, there's no question that somebody who was wanted domestically would not be lawfully handled by drone strike, but by arrest and, and prosecution by the FBI. And he yelled at me and um, 
all the other panelists, uh, which were of diverse ideological persuasion, agreed with me, and uh, he got very upset. So he didn't like that answer. <laughs> What's that? It seems like he would like that answer. No, I think he wanted the answer. I don't know what answer he wanted. He's not entirely sane. Yeah. Uh, and, um, but you know, as Roman Hruska said of Mr. of Judge Carswell when he was nominated to be on the Supreme Court and he was accused of mediocrity, there are many mediocre people in America and they deserve representation <laughs> on the Supreme Court too. And that's kind of the way I feel about Louis Gohmert. There are it is many representative crazed, democracy. Nutcase, <laughs> crazed nutcases in the United States and they need representation in the House of Representatives. Well, I mean, I have noticed with these um, here, with these Zoom hearings that because um, they've done a few like as try to try them out, um, they're actually surprisingly mellow. Um, I, I don't I don't know why that is. Maybe it's just because it's a new technology and people are being civil. But um, I, I don't I can't decide exactly how I feel about it because it it is more mellow. It feels more civil, um, and I think that's a good thing. Um, although I do miss. I have to say, I do miss that sort of like live sparring and- Reserving and the right that. to object. Yeah, yeah. So I miss that a little bit, but it does seem more civilized, both these Zoom hearings I've seen and also the now live in-person hearings. I don't, maybe that's just because we're in the middle of a pandemic and people are just sort of a little more I don't sober. Think it is. I think it has something to do with the latency in the technology so that when you're speaking, if I speak over you, I'm not sure that I'm not going to glitch. Yeah. And there's there may be this tiny little delay so that the point at which I'm interrupting you is the wrong point, right? You've already right. moved on by the time anybody You come in just like mid-scream. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And then, you know, it may cut off the first part. And so I may like sound like a, a nut, which if you happen to be one may not bother you, but if you happen to not be one, may give you just a little bit more pause right. about leaping in. And that right. gives everybody just a tiny bit more restraint. And that restraint actually iterates over hundreds and hundreds of interactions and produces a more mellow ambience. I also okay. think there's something to like, you know, if you're if you're a member of Congress and you're sitting in your home office and you're like screaming like crazy at your computer, it's sort of it's a different vibe than your if you're in like, person. Dad, you're being <laughs> yeah, like, you, you feel like a crazy person when you're just in your office alone screaming at a computer computer as opposed to like You've been doing in a, a hearing room, you're looking at something, you know, you just so I think it's also like, a, oh, do I really want to you know, how people think of themselves. Like, I don't want to think of myself as a crazy person screaming at myself I in the office. I so agree with that. I hey, think Ben. Is... Hey, Ben. Yeah. Knock, knock. Who's there? Interrupting cow. <laughs> Interrupting <That's> cow. Cool. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> yeah. What's the secret to good comedy, Kate? Um... Timing. <laughs> um... Yeah, I think that I, I totally agree with your point. I think acting like you're performing, which people like congressional hearings are centrally about performance. And, you know, to the point that we even like grade them that way. We're like, you know, how did Mr. Ratcliffe do today? Mm -hmm. We don't say, well, what did he say? Right? We, we ask like, how did, did he overperform expectations? We talk about it in the language of performance. And when you're sitting at home in a home office, mm -hmm. you don't feel like you're performing. Right. And so, you know, when you're in a congressional hearing, you're sitting there and it's all like very serious. You got the table in front of you and you're like, that's a performance. But you're sitting at home, you're relaxed, you're chill. You the don't, birds are chirping outside of my yeah, and the helicopters here. are flying by like a hundred feet overhead because it's in northwest Washington, and you don't, you just don't react that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I don't know. It's it's right. a different vibe. So, so one more, um, Margaret, 
is Congress totally fucked or only mostly fucked? <laughs> Mostly, but not totally. <laughs> Mostly, um, but not totally. Yeah. That's pretty optimistic for most congressional analysts. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean- when, going... when somebody asks you about the state of Congress, how many words does it take you before you get to the root dysfunction? You know, I, I don't speak about it that way because I speak about it more, more in the vein of trying to have people understand what motivates different members to do what they do. And so in order to be taken seriously, I try to just be a little more, just use non curse words to explain why Mitch McConnell is doing the thing that he is doing. Cause I, I think that, or that's just an example, different members do things for different reasons. I think that Americans have this, um, this notion that like, you know, people will, are, are doing things based on principle and high-minded notions. And there, there are some people who are like that. They, they tend to be new members. <laughs> um, but you know, I, the, what I try to say- have it beaten out of them with whips. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, what I try to say is like, you know, these people are responding to what, largely to what they think their constituents want. And so if a particular member is acting in a certain way and being kind of crazy, you have to ask the question, does the people that vote for him, particularly in the house, they vote every two years, they get reelected or not every two years, the people in that person's district are looking at their member and they're evaluating them. And you know what? Those people like what they see. And so you have to think about it in terms of, you know, the people who are voting for this person and you know that person gets reelected over and over and over you know Louis Gummert's been in the house for a long time and so i think as a as an american it's useful to think about it that way <laughs> because we have to understand our fellow americans are a, a great diverse group of people who who don't see things necessarily the way i see them or the way we see them and so it's, it's not enough, I think, to just say like, they're all just crazy and, and corrupt and dysfunctional. You have to ask the question of, you know, why is this person who I think is crazy and dysfunctional and corrupt getting reelected every two years over and over and over and over. <laughs> so. So if there are 535 members of Congress, if we had to have one on in lieu of fun, who should it be? Okay, so I would definitely go, oh, my two former bosses are not gonna like this, but I would go with Brian Schatz of Hawaii. Cause- I, like um, I talked with his office a lot. He, okay, so I just think, I've actually never even met him, like, but he, I just think he's so, he's so funny. Yeah, and he's bright, he seems like a bright guy. He's very bright, he's very funny. He's very like principled. Um, and he's, he's like one of these young, senators you know i think he would just be fun and and would understand the spirit of this and the, the sort of good fun of it um so that would be my that would be my pick. all right that's that's a what do you think kate can you reach out that. to his office and <laughs> i'm also going to invite jim himes whom i think is uh, a, a intelligence committee member from connecticut who i interviewed on cybercrime issues at New York University not too long ago, and I was super impressed with. I thought was a remarkably thoughtful, and and uh, his detailed knowledge of cybercrime issues was really interesting to me, and I just thought was really impressive. And he follows me on Twitter, which means I can DM him. What do you think about doing like, I don't know, well, maybe like the sen senators or something. I don't know. I was thinking Cantwell has a new privacy bill. It'd be kind of great to hear from her. Yeah, maybe we should we should do like Congress week. We, we, can, do, we can combine the next pugilism week with Congress <laughs> week and pair two congressmen that really- Oh yeah, the yeah. they really don't want to have Zoom votes, but they're totally going to come on our show and <laughs> 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 while having a beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, know, like, you can get them more comfortable like, with Mitch the technology McConnell and chuck schumer yeah we would get schumer and mcconnell on and gear them up and see what happens 
my my former well all both my judges are, I think are good well I'm not going to say it but anyways we're not going to probably be getting Chuck Schumer on in little fun but we'll see but we could we get uh, it'd be a interesting can to dream. see if we could get any federal judges sitting federal judges sure I mean I don't you know we so can invite Emmett Sullivan I would love to invite him call the series pending and impending cases. So that it's like I'm really like, clearly on. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that there's no way that Emmett Sullivan can come on our show. <laughs> well, um, Judge Emmett, Sull Emmett G. Sullivan, if you are listening, if you watch this on YouTube, come have a drink with us on In Lieu of Friends. You'd be like, so how are you going to rule? Hmm. Yeah, exactly. I would just we're ask only, him about We're Tennessee. only going to ask you questions about pending and impending cases. None of this. None of this shit that you can answer, okay? <laughs> Margaret Taylor, so much fun to have Thank you. Thank you for oh, having so me. Much, so much in lieu of fun. Uh, I will see you tomorrow morning at 9.30 <laughs> yeah, for right. our Lawfare Morning Editorial meeting. <laughs> uh, oh, Gergi just walked into the room. Hello, Gergi. Um, my new one-eyed dog. Nice. Well, um, thanks, you guys. I'm I'm so flattered, and I I watch the I watch the show, so I'm like just thrilled to be on it. It's, it's so fun to have you. This Tell the world about my fish. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm now gonna have like a new new like new procrastination thing of looking up this like she totally she's creepy. Head. Creepy. I'll send yeah. them to you. I'll take some. You have to, send them to you. the good morning image on Twitter may have to be. Do you have a picture of yourself with the, with the sheep's head? I do, but it doesn't show the teeth. But yeah, I do have a picture. Mm. I was I was 30 years old at the time, so I look a lot younger, but it's me. Yeah. Cool. Well, you maybe I'm going to have to, in your honor, tweet a sheep's head as the good <laughs> morning great. image tomorrow. Um, so uh, who do we have on the show for tomorrow? Uh, Emily Bell, I think, is going to come on from the Tau Center of Journalism at Columbia. Cool. Um, so uh, what are we going to talk about with her? Oh, I don't know. She's just good fun and is like lovely. And I was thinking that we would talk about journalism and, you know, newspapers and then journalism again, you know, <laughs> no, I think, I actually think that it would, I think it'll be really good. I think that she's got some, um, she was pretty upset about some of the oversight board members. And then like, I don't know, it'll just be like kind of interesting to hear what she has to say right now about everything that's going on. Um, awesome. She, yeah. Gurgi, hi. Yeah, ben, you look, less, you look less angry with, with your dog. You're being able to pet your, it's like an emotional he, support dog. Yeah, and he's got his cone off. Yeah. And he, he looks uh, great, Ben. He looks yeah, so Yeah, he's good. all placid and- Happy. I mean, he, he was, he was, uh, he was half, shaved and half not shaved half fluffy mm -hmm. uh until the other day when tammy clipped him on the mm -hmm. side that he was uh so now he's a little bit more even than he was before the surgery um he's doing good and he's <laughs> as always very cuddly mm. um all right we are a little bit over thank you margaret again thanks for having me this was super fun. Oh, wait, do we have uh, a Murder Hornet video as a sign off? <laughs> yeah, we sure do. To like put aside my dozens and dozens of sheephead fish uh, <laughs> pictures. That's a little embarrassing. Um, let's see. <laughs> you think I'm joking? I yeah, actually have like 17 their, open in like different types. No, I believe it. Yeah. I was like, that one's bad. Oh, that one's worse. <laughs> All right. Um, here we go. You ready for it? Oh yeah. Oh, oh. Praying mantis v she a v v murder hornet. Yeah, Wait, I, I was I was not expecting the praying mantis to win. Oh yeah, praying the praying mantis, mantis wins. That's like oh. praying mantises are like badass. Oh okay. Full disclosure, um, I had a praying mantis. This is such a me thing as a pet and had it under a glass in like a cage. And then like one day it just like laid eggs all over the cage. And like, I was like, that's enough of that. <laughs> like <laughs> well, they wouldn't have hatched because you know, the praying mantis is called the praying mantis wow. because it uh, eats 
the uh, male praying mantis after it fertilizes her eggs. But like, is it internal or external fertilization? I believe it's external. Okay. Well, that this praying mantis just ate that. Entire that is like. Thing. Look at that. It's like it's like crumbs. It's like crumbs. <laughs> so Not now either. you know murder hornets are defeatable. We just need a fleet uh, of praying mantises to send to Northwest. That uh, praying mantis is United named Wittis, and that murder hornet is named Putin. Just saying. Are you we'll just picking another tomorrow. fight, Ben? So yeah, a good friend texted me that does trust and safety on Twitter and asked if I've been recently picking fights with Russian bots. And I said, no, just my friends have, and they're adding me. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you, know, you, you, you hang out with me. I know. Uh, Russian bots are going to tweet about you. It's just I the way know. it is. Guys. We will see you all tomorrow. And until then, Kate. If you can't have fun. You still have us. <laughs> in lieu of fun. In no, lieu of fun. Whatever. God damn it, Ben. It's only Otherwise been 45 you, days. You expect me to realize this? the goddamn point. <laughs> yeah, the title of the show. All right. Bye, you know, guys. Ben. I can't reach the, the button to end the show, but here it goes. <laughs>